The joys of two services. We love that. I, that we love that, that need right there. Well, welcome, guys. We are in our third week of our Advent series. We're talking about the arrival of Jesus. Not We're, we're doing it as we rehearse the, the celebration of the birth of Christ, right? This birthday gift he gave us. <clears throat> but but we're, we're anticipating something else, right? And we're, and we're proclaiming the Lord's death until he, what? returns and appears, right? So, so we have this uh, uh, sense of arrival that we're, that we're anticipating and, and making ourselves hopefully ready for. And last week we talked about the surprise that Mary received, that we can be surprised, but we don't have to be unprepared, right? That, that, that she wasn't in a place of trust and verify when she went to Elizabeth. But, and and this, is, this is funny. I told you guys sometimes that the staff does this to me. They will they will trust me, but they'll verify some of the words that I use at times. I, I look down at my service order, and it says, you use this word, and we had to go check it. Who knew? It's, it's correct. That's what they said to me. That's in, and, and so they were giving me props, but it felt, it felt kind of backhanded. I got to say that. It was a compliment, but they know that I like to use big words sometimes. And uh, I, 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 I got to say, 98% of the time, they're accurate, Okay. The other times, I just make sure I'm confident enough that they seem accurate. <laughs> so, no, we want to welcome you to this journey we're taking. Um, thank you, Sartz, for leading us today uh, in this idea of joy. Thank you, worship team, uh, for leading us as well. Uh, as we enter into this new week, uh, when we're, we're, we're talking about substance here. Um, what, what of Jesus and his arrival what was, what, what was of the substance that we can pull from that, that would allow us to, with more, with more fervor, uh, believe in faith in, in Christ and know that His second coming is something we can trust in? Okay, that's what we're at. And there, there's a relatively new, and I say that it's really not that new anymore, uh, currency that only exists online. It's called cryptocurrency, Right? Uh, these are some of those things that you see. There's a lot more of them. I had to, I had to you know, white out the, the name of the group that put this slide together. But you guys can see there's lots of things out there that, that, that people are into. But the thing is, it, Bitcoin is one of the examples that most people would know about. But the challenge is for governments and regulators and traders um, is, is there because, it's, because it's, it's something that really doesn't exist it's there, but it doesn't exist. You guys know what I'm saying? Like the dollar or the euro or the yen. We can see those things. We can have them in our hands. We can trade with them. Even though lots of things are going online these days, this currency was invented to make secure transactions online. It was meant to replace you having to go to the bank and take some money out and transfer it to there. It was, it was able to be used this way. It can also be mined. I don't care to know how you do that, but you can go out there and you can find this stuff with the right kind of graphic cards and things like that. But the government doesn't accept it. That's still true, correct? They don't accept it, and here's why. Uh, because uh, if, if they did, then they'd have to figure out how to tax it. <laughs> and they can't tax it, so they don't accept it unless someone cashes it in for real money, right? And, and, and that's, that's, that's necessary. So it begs the question for us this morning, and this is going somewhere. Not, we're not just talking about cryptocurrency this morning. How to use it for Jesus. That's not what we're doing. Okay. But here's the question. If it doesn't exist as something backed by something real, does it really exist? Okay. And, and again, that's, we're not talking about cryptocurrency. We're using that as a jumping off point here. Matthew, in his gospel, answers that question for us regarding Jesus. Okay, right at the beginning of his gospel, he gives us something of substance to kind of sink our, our teeth into, pro proverbially, and, and he wants us to know something. He wants his readers to know that the promised Messiah was absolutely real. Absolutely real, without a doubt. There's verifiable proof for that. And there are links in this substance that we can sink our teeth into that help us understand how real he was. Mary though she was surprised by the announcement, knew the Messiah was real, right? She had this baby growing in her womb. She knew he was real. But for the rest of us, one proof, the one proof we have is Jesus' genealogy. It begins to connect us to the past and help verify through, and this is the word I used in staff meeting, the historicity of this, okay? It is historically accurate. 
And there are things to prove that, that not only coincide with the time of Jesus, but historically proven times where we see Jesus' name mentioned and people, people believe that he was a man that existed. We're going to look at that. Matthew chapter 1. Matthew chapter 1. We're going to read, actually, actually read some of these names, okay? Have you ever tried to read all of these names, by the way? All right. I, so this is why people go to seminary. To read the genealogy of Jesus. I'm just kidding, that's not true. But here's the genealogy of Jesus. It says we go from Abraham to David and, and, and all the way to Jesus, and there's some things in between. This is what we're looking at. The arrival of Jesus, the Messiah, the Christ, right? The anointed one, God, is this. God made human in Jesus, Emmanuel, right? God is with us in him. And, and, and we need to be people who trust in the incarnation of Jesus, the Word made flesh. We need to be people who trust in that. In other words, it's the, it's the realness of Jesus. And, and, and we, we believe because we see evidence, right? Like Jesus talked with, with, with Nicodemus, he says, you don't, know, you don't see the wind blow, right? But you know it's there, you feel it, you feel its effects. You don't know where it comes from or where it's going, but you understand that it is real, even if you can't see it, but on top of the, the ability to have faith in something that you know is there, but you can't always see it, is, is this. We skip over it a lot, or we sometimes we'll read it, but, but this is some substance that we can really help to use, verify all this stuff. So let me read some of these things, um, and, and, and I think we, we, you'll just go with me, okay, with the names. So the genealogy of Jesus, the Messiah, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham was the father of Isaac, Isaac the father of Jacob, Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers, Judah the father of Perez and Zerah, whose mother was Tamar, Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, Ram the father of Abinadab, Aminadab, sorry, Aminadab, the father of Nashon, Nashon, the father of, and I'm just going to say Salmon, because I can't tell, I can't make this guy's name Salmon, okay? <laughs> Salmon, the father of Boaz, whose mother was Rahab. Boaz, the father of Obed, whose mother was Ruth. Obed, the father of Jesse. And Jesse was the father of King David. David was the father of Solomon, whose mother had been Uriah's wife. Solomon, the father of Rehoboam. Rehoboam, the father of Abijah. Abijah, the father of Asa. Asa, the father of Jehoshaphat. Jehoshaphat, the father of Jehoram. Jehoram, the father of Uzziah. Uzziah, the father of Jotham. Jotham, the, Jotham, the father of Ahaz. Ahaz, the father of Hezekiah. Hezekiah, the father of Manasseh. Manasseh, the father of Amon. Amon, the father of Josiah, and Josiah, the father of Jeconi, Je Je yeah, I said, it, I said it right in my head, it didn't come out, and his brothers the, at the time of the exile to Babylon, and the exile, after the exile to Babylon, verse 12, Jeconi was the father of Shealtiel, Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel, Zerubbabel, the father of Abihud, Abihud, the father of El Eliakim, Eliakim, the father of Azor, Azor, the father of Zadok, Zadok, the father of Akim, Akim, the father of Elihud, Elihud, the father of Eleazar, Eleazar, the father of Mathan, Mathan, the father of Jacob, and Jacob, the father of Joseph, Joseph the husband of Mary, and Mary was the mother of Jesus, who is called the Messiah. Somebody almost clapped. I, 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 would, I would accept that. <laughs> Thus, verse 17, there were 14 generations in all from Abraham to David, 14 from David to the exile to Babylon, and 14 from the exile to the Messiah. This is substance here. And I know it's a lot of names, but it is something we can begin to realize links us to the, 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 the realness of Jesus from his past to him and beyond. Now, this idea of 14 generations in between, I, I love this, but think about the arc that we just read. Uh, you, you, you start with the person who is known to be the father of Israel, right? We want to we link this back into the genesis of the nation, which is linked to the genesis of the world, but we want to start there at least for the nation of Israel because that's what really connects us all as a family, he's, he's saying, okay? 
the beginning of the nation, all the way to David, this greatest king, the highest of heights, right? The ark begins to, begins to turn, and then we hear about there are still people that link us to the kind of the lowest of lows with this exile in Babylon. This ark is crazy, but it's not just about the ark that happened. Both of these men who are, who are uh, uh, mentioned, Abraham and David, were, uh, they received significant promises from God. Things that he promised that came true and then came true again. But this idea of three 14 generation segments, I, I, I wish because I, I just like numbers, I wish there was some real significance. Here's what they say though, okay? Even though they don't know. They think that Matthew, being a, a guy that loves numbers, they think that, the, this is for all the number nerds out there, in Hebrew, David's name has three letters and those three letters have a numerical value of 14. And so he, he wanted to express and highlight the centrality of David and his role in, in the, not just the lineage of Jesus, but his role in how the Messiah comes from him. And so we understand the story of Jesus through the story of David. And so that he thinks that because he is, a, he is a Jew, he wants everyone to understand that. Do you guys get what I'm saying there? Otherwise, it's just like a multiple of seven, seven being the number of God. All those things are really cool, right? But it doesn't go beyond there, so just leave it alone. All right. Here's what we know from the genealogy of Jesus. It's a link that, number one, proves that the promise and descendants of Abraham are real. This is real. And we can back this up as we take it all the way to the end and then apply it to it. The account of Abraham in Genesis marks the end of the theogony of the Hebrew God and the beginning of Hebrew history. And we have what you would call in Genesis chapter 12, the Abrahamic covenant, right? That, that, that says this. Let me, get, let me get there for us. It says, The Lord had said to Abraham, Abram, go from your country, your people, and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all the peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abraham, Abram went as the Lord had told him. It's a really great understanding of, of this promise that God made to a man, a sing, singular guy with a family, who was going to leave everything that he was connected to to go and begin a, to grow his family in a way that would grow a nation out of it. This takes us from the patriarchs, right? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the, the fathers of the faith, if you will, all the way into the kings, we see. His family grows until the, the people of Israel grow, and we have Moses in between there, right? We have some bad things that happen, some good things that happen, and, and, and this nation begins to grow, and they want leadership, and God says, I'm the only leader you need, and they said, no, we need a king, and so they have all these kings, right? But Saul is the first one, all the way to David, and David, he doesn't have to dethrone the king. He waits on God to do what he needs to do, and David is established as the king. Who has used Ancestry.com, by the way? Just raise your hands. There's a few of us out there. Okay. And the need for that is, is very significant in our lives. Sometimes it's curiosity, but a lot of times it's, I want to know where I came from, whom I belong to. And it becomes a very real, very almost tangible kind of desire uh, to know. They, they trace one's oldest ancestors, if you will. This is what they say they do. They help you understand your genealogy through a family tree that takes you back generations. The world's largest collection of online family history records makes it possible to do this. So they've brought all this data together so that based on sometimes people will just read through based on their name, sometimes they'll take a DNA test, right? I don't know if, how many that raised their hands actually went that far, but you can take a DNA test and Ancestry DNA gives you much more than just the places you're from. With precise geographic detail and clear-cut historical insights, we connect you to the places in the world where your story started, from unique regions to living relatives. I think that's really cool, right? And they go on to talk about how the DNA part of this really works and how, how, they, how they connect through the other databases that are out there, people that even sometimes are living that you are relatives of. 
uh, they, they make it possible for you to link yourself to your history that you may not have known. And that's what Matthew was. If he was anything for us, not just a disciple, he was like the, the, the historian of the group. He wanted to make sure that you knew, that, that, that people knew their connection to the past. It was something they had to pass down from generation to generation. And he began to write this stuff down. And for the Israelites, and now us as adopted sons and daughters, Abraham is like the father of everyone, right? Right? Okay, okay, I just want to make sure you're with me. It's important that he be included... And it's important that we trust God because he kept his promise to the man Abraham. Yeah. As Abram believed. And so number two, we know that the promise and descendants of Abraham are real, but we also, this link proves that the promise and descendants of David are real. Archaeology now is finding artifacts of a Davidic kingdom in the specific region where they would have been some, some of these regions have, were fought over later on. Some continue to be, but they're finding artifacts that would date and, and prove and link us to a Davidic kingdom. And, and I will just say this, science will continue to do this. Just wait on it, okay? Sometimes it feels like it's light years ahead of us, and sometimes it feels like it's so far behind. And we just have to be patient. But the Davidic covenant is one that is a promise that we should look at as well. It's in 2 Samuel chapter 7. And, and, and this is where <laughs> God kind of goes on a little bit of a scolding of David, but then he gives him a promise at the end. So it's, it's, kind, of a, it's kind of like a, hey, you, you're acting up, but let me remind you of what I'm going to do. David says, I, I, I've lived in this palatial place and God doesn't have a place to live. I want to build him a house. And, and God says, all the other people behind you, did they ever, did they ever, were they ever asked by me to build me a house? Did I ever give that need to them? Why are you the one who you think should be doing this? He goes, nonetheless, though, this is what the Lord Almighty says, verse 8, I took you from the pasture, from tending the flock, and appointed you ruler over my people Israel. I have been with you wherever you have gone, and I have cut off all your enemies from before you. Now I will make your name great, like the names of the greatest men on earth, and I will provide a place for my people. So David's saying, let me provide you a place to stay. And he goes, no, no, no I'm going to establish something different. I will provide a place for my people Israel and will plant them so that they can have a home of their own and no longer be disturbed. Moving down to the second part of verse 11, the Lord declares to you that the Lord himself will establish a house for you. So I'm going to do this for you, not you don't need to do this for me. When your days are over and, your rest with your, and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father, and he will be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with a rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But... My love will never be taken away from him as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed from before you. Your house, your house, he says to David, and your kingdom will endure forever before me. Your throne will be established forever. We understand that Jesus is the, is the answer to the Davidic Messiah, this bloodline relative. And so we get these wonderful promises that David, I, you, you don't have to build me a house. Your son can do that. What I'm going to establish through you is something that will endure forever. And, and he gets this promise and he believes him for it. And he doesn't pursue what some of us like to pursue is something tangible and real that I can put my hands on, that I can say we accomplished. And God sometimes in our lives and in his life as well is accomplishing something eternal that we can't always sink our hands into, right? And so he gave him this promise. And this takes us from the king's to what we maybe just call the deportation, right? Uh, what other way? But before we go there, how many of you have used Ancestry.com? Okay, we, we've established that. How many of you have traveled and visited places where your ancestors lived? Anybody taken those trips? Okay, some of the same people here. 
It makes it more concrete or real to you when you go to the place where your ancestors lived, right? You go and maybe you even find a, a living relative and you share a meal with them and you talk with them about stories and they send you home with something that, that really is from that place. Those things matter, right? And now we're beginning to see that people are finding things that link us to the Davidic kingdom and the Davidic covenant that was given. This stuff is real and it's being proven for us and it's linking us to what the Bible says links Jesus to us as well. To know these places that, we, that our ancestors lived makes it more real. And it helps us to trust God because he kept his promise to a man named David. And finally, number three, this link proves that the promise and descendants of the captivity or the exile are real. All right, this exile they talk about is in Babylon. Babylon is a real historical place, right? They even, they even uh, if, you, if you go and look up the, the historicity okay, of Babylon, what it says is it was a really amazing place that the Greeks revered, right? And they loved it. Why? Because they had these hanging gardens that was like back then, one of the seven wonders of the ancient world. They had so many artifacts and things that linked them to this wonderful place. And then you start to read and it goes, but the Bible doesn't really give it a really good name. It kind of sours the name because in the Bible, it's the source of the exile of God's people, right? And, and, and it's, it, it's the place where when, um, uh, when Daniel was reading the scrolls that, Jer that included Jeremiah, the prophet, and Jeremiah said it'll be 70 years and then he'll... He'll bring them out of exile, right? There's a date on it. Daniel reads that and begs God for this moment. That's the, that's the source in the Bible that kind of sours the, the name of the Babylonian Empire. This place actually, the ruins of it lie in modern-day Iraq, 59 miles southwest of Baghdad, if you ever wanted to go. The Greeks, again, loved this place. They revered it. Not so great in the Bible, not just because of the exile, but also the Tower of Babel. Is connected as well. History regards Babylon as a real place in a real land that now we have links historically to. And so as you begin to see how some of these links prove places that then the Bible speaks of, you begin to realize, man, the Holy Spirit was a part of this, even this genealogy, to help us understand the substance of where Jesus comes from. And again, this is kind of like the icing on the cake of your faith as you believe in Jesus, though you can't always see him, right? He's not tangibly in front of you. You believe in him, right? And this stuff just helps us understand even greater and, give, and have even more faith in what's going on. History regards this place as real, and it takes us from captivity, the captivity, another 14 generations, to Mary, who is said that may have still been alive as Matthew was writing these records down. Speaking to one's relatives who lived the history makes it more real, doesn't it? Yeah. I sat down with my grandfather who lived and fought through World War II, and it gave me just a love to understand, a desire to know and understand that, that time for the people of America and the world and how it all affected us and why people did it. And I got into far more, but the most important things I remember are the things that my, my grandfather told me of actually being uh, um, a pacifist and working in hospitals and having bombs coming down and literally he should have been killed and there was somebody who he describes as, as a real person who came and pulled him away from a place where a bomb dropped. And, and then later on, going back to find that person, they were completely gone. And just in, like an angel miraculously coming. Just stuff like that links you to these things, right? And, and I, I remember, if it, 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 this is not a, okay, maybe I should just say spoiler alert. If, you, if you're watching The Chosen, you haven't gotten to season two, it starts with something very cool. And it starts with John, older, sitting with an older Mary, trying to figure out how he's going to describe his encounter with Jesus and who this person was. 
And he goes, I can't, I can't do it like Matthew. He has all the details. I don't need to do it like that, right? You guys remember what I'm talking about? Matthew has all those details. I, I don't need to do it that way. How can I describe who he is? And he begins, they begin to, to link the thunder and them being called the sons of thunder. And thunder is hitting as he's thinking and he's talking. And just it becomes this really cool place. But he's sitting there with the mother of Jesus, whom Jesus from the cross says, this is your mom. Take care of her. It matters and it makes it more real and concrete when the person who has lived through it is sitting with you. It's priceless information sitting right in front of him. Who had probably in her family, like we see here, people who were raised by those who were in captivity. Maybe 15 to 20 generations back, but you get there to the beginning of the exile and it makes it more real. It connects us. It allows us to trust God because he kept his promise to the woman Mary. So as we, as we wrap this up and, and Josh comes up, even secular historians believe that Jesus of Nazareth was a real person. We know that. It's an established fact. They don't, they don't deny that he lived. They just try to downplay who he was. And at Christmas time, we celebrate the birth, the birthday of, of a real person then, right? It connects us. We, we know that history says this to us. And now we have other things connecting us to just even a genealogy. It makes more sense. It, it makes it more real for us. And so what does that realness do? What does that substance do for our lives today? We, celebrating the birth of Jesus is a good thing, but in reality, he didn't tell us again to remember, and I've been doing this every week, he didn't tell us to remember his birth, right? He said to proclaim his death until he returns. And so what does the substance of Jesus mean for us? And we're going to use the same pattern again. It means that Jesus' death on the cross was real. So if you can believe Ancestry.com and you can trust a verified genealogy, and, and it connects you to people and to things and you believe even more in who you are and it, it begins to establish something in you of who you are as a person because you can trust the DNA that verifies who you are. You see what I'm saying? That as you look at the genealogy of Jesus and it begins to connect to history and that history begins to connect to other things that people have said and it brings us into this story, you can trust him. You can believe that the death on the cross was real even if people don't want to believe that it was real in the way it was. You can believe that Jesus' resurrection was real. If you can believe he was linked to things in history, like artifacts that are being uncovered of, the, of a Davidic kingdom, the person that it was said that Jesus came from, then you can believe that if he was a real person on this earth and that real person we know died on a cross and it was verified that he actually was in a borrowed tomb they all believe all of that we can believe that he raised from the dead and all, we can also believe number three that his physical return to earth is also real right and so this is where our faith begins to expand in this story not just celebrating the birth of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, the incarnation, the word become, be, becoming flesh. But it means that that word becoming flesh went through a process of growing up, ministering, dying, resurrecting from the dead and ascending to heaven and then saying, I'm going to come back and we can sink our teeth into that. And we can be surprised, yes, at when it comes, but also prepared for the real return of the King. So our take home today is this. The question is not, do we believe in the birth of Jesus? Pretty much everyone believes that it's history. But do you believe in Jesus' real death, resurrection, and return? That's where the rubber meets the road here for us. And the answer to that is your salvation. And then maybe ask this question. Do you have an area of the life of Jesus, if you're going to talk about this, that causes you not to believe in him? Is there something that just doesn't feel quite right? You don't really understand it yet? Talk about that with somebody. It's okay. God doesn't, God doesn't shrink back from 
doubt or fear, he, he embraces it with you if you'll take it to him and begin to show you things. His truth sets us free. It's a light to us. So those are the questions you can take home. And the answer to that first question, do you believe in the realness of his death, resurrection, and return? That is an answer to our salvation. You can sink your teeth into it. It's a substance like the icing on the cake that allows you to put your faith in Christ. Let's sing the song together as we worship him in this reality.